All right, welcome back. As always, let's dive in with the questions. So go ahead and pause the video, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. So the correct answer here is D. So let's talk about DKA, which typically results from insulin non-compliance or increased needs in periods of extreme stress. So DKA results when there's an absence of insulin and the presence of ketones, which leads to the problems that are associated with this condition. Before we go into the diagnostic criteria, it's important that you're aware of the common presentation of DKA, which includes any of the following. Your patient may present with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, delirium, dehydration, fruity breath, which is caused by what? Caused by acetone, as well as an odd respiratory pattern that we call Kussmaul respirations, which remember is characterized by rapid, deep breathing. Now, when it comes to diagnosing with labs, remember that, of course, hyperglycemia will be seen, as is increased hydrogen and decreased bicarb, which leads to an increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. We'll see elevated levels of urine ketones as well as leukocytosis. The presence of acidosis will result in transcellular shift of potassium out of cells, meaning elevated serum potassium can be seen, but this isn't always the case. Keep that in mind. Now, the presence of osmotic diuresis will increase the amount of potassium that's lost in the urine, and this results in overall total body, a total body depletion of potassium, which is why we can see fatal conditions such as uh, cardiac arrhythmias develop in DKA. Now, additional complications associ associated with D DKA may be cerebral edema, um, heart failure, as well as mucormycosis. So let's say we've recognized DKA, now we need to help our patient. What do we do? So I want you to remember just some overlying principles. We wanna give IV fluids, IV insulin, potassium, and glucose. Now, before we move on, what would we call a patient who has severe hyperglycemia, but there's insulin and there's no ketones? We would call this a hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. And this is going to cause excessive osmotic diuresis, leading to dehydration and increased serum osmolality. This is almost always seen in an older patient who has type 2 diabetes who simply is not drinking enough fluids. So the presentation is often with thirst, with polyuria, lethargy. You might see focal neural deficits. You might see seizures. And this is characterized by severe hyperglycemia, oftentimes above 600 milligrams per deciliter, and serum osmolalities above 320 milliosmoles per kilogram. But you'll see normal pH and you'll see no signs of ketones. So if you see all of these things that are swirling around and you're thinking DKA, 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 but then they say you have um, pH is normal, so there's no um, anion gap metabolic acidosis, and you see that there are no ketones in the blood, you're thinking, okay, this doesn't make sense. Think of this condition. Now, if we don't get on this right away, this can cause coma and this can lead to death. So even though this isn't DKA, this is serious stuff. So you wanna make sure you treat the patient right away. What are we gonna do? IV fluids, IV insulin, and potassium. Because just as in DKA, there's a drop in intracellular potassium. But remember, be careful here. There's no um, lack of insulin, so there is insulin and there are no ketones in this condition. All right, let's move on to our next question. As always, go ahead and pause the video, try and figure this one out, and then we will see you back here when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is D, bilateral adrenal atrophy. So Cushing syndrome, it's usually fairly obvious by the characteristic physical changes that they'll give us. So we'll see uh, striae, buffalo hump, truncal obesity, moon faces, hirsutism. But don't forget that there's additional findings that we can't see. Things like, like uh, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, immune suppression, growth retardation in children, hyperglycemia, as well as amenorrhea. Now, one of the most common ways you're likely to be asked about Cushing syndrome on exam day is by the underlying cause, which can vary from exogenous corticosteroid administration to a pituitary adenoma. So let's look at those common causes and then talk about making a diagnosis, which is also a area of confusion for some students. So some of the common causes, as I mentioned, include the use of corticosteroids, which is your most common cause of Cushing syndrome. And this will lower the secretion of ACTH. Visualization of the abdomen will also demonstrate bilateral atrophy of the adrenal glands, which of course was the correct answer to this specific question. Now, another cause of Cushing syndrome is the presence of an adrenal adenoma, uh, carcinoma, or simply uh, adrenal hyperplasia. 
This too will lead to a drop in ACTH, but the key here is that the unaffected side will atrophy while the lesion will be seen in the affected side. Now, we can get an ACTH secreting tumor in the pituitary. That's what we call Cushing disease. And this is responsible for a large number of the endogenous causes. We also see ACTH secretion in other conditions, such as small cell lung cancer, which will cause atrophy of both adrenal glands as well. So let's say we suspect Cushing syndrome. How do we make our diagnosis? Well, to screen for it, we can check free cortisol via urinalysis, and that's gonna demonstrate an increase in free cortisol. We can also check what is known as the late night salivary cortisol. That would also be high. And we have the dexamethasone suppression test, which if Cushing syndrome is present, that overnight low dose dexamethasone suppression test will not cause suppression. Before we move on, let's take a look at something known as Nelson syndrome, which is a condition that occurs following the bilateral removal of the adrenals for a case of refractory Cushing disease. And this is gonna result in the enlargement of a pre-existing ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma that increases ACTH leading to hyperpigmentation. It causes compression of the adjacent structures, can cause headache as well as bitemporal hemianopia. Now this is managed how? Simply by removal of that tumor. Now I want you to take a look at the next slide here in your books and let's look at the flow chart and I'll walk you through the way by which we can assess a patient and diagnose the problem with um, the dexamethasone suppression test. So the first step here is an identified increase in 24 hour urine cortisol. So we can do the urine cortisol, we can check salivary or simply that inadequate suppression with the overnight low dose dexamethasone suppression test uh, to, to uh, measure the serum ACTH and see if it's suppressed or not. If suppressed, this is indicative of an ACTH independent Cushing syndrome and it's either due to exogenous glucocorticoid administration or an adrenal tumor. If we can confirm glucocorticoid use, we know the problem and we can just fix it. If there's no glucocorticoid use, we can confirm the presence of an adrenal lesion with a CT. If serum ACTH is elevated, this is an ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome and we'll do either the high dose dexamethasone suppression test or the CRH stimulation test. Now we can do the CRH stimulation test to evaluate the etiology of ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome and determine if the problem is in the pituitary or if it's ectopic. Now the problem with the CRH test is it is very expensive. Now, the other options, of course, the high dose de dexamethasone suppression test, which please don't forget is not really used anymore in the diagnosis of ACTH independent Cushing syndrome, only in ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. Now in those with Cushing disease, which is caused by the pituitary, the high dose dexamethasone suppression test is often suppressed, while the ectopic uh, sources are not, giving us a simple way to differentiate between the two causes. So if we give the high dose dexa and we get suppression, we can safely assume a pituitary cause and then just get imaging of the pituitary for confirmation. If on the other hand, no suppression occurs, we know that the source is ectopic and now we have to do some more digging to find the source. To do this, we'll get imaging of the chest, the pelvis, and the abdomen. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and pause the video and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The answer here is D, hyperkalemia. All right, let's talk about adrenal insufficiency, which is a condition that's characterized by the adrenal glands inability to produce sufficient glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, and this results in a myriad of symptoms that range from fatigue, myalgias, weaknesses, orthostatic hypotension, GI disturbances, weight loss, as well as an increased craving for salt and sugar. So in primary adrenal insufficiency, we have a decreased function in the glands themselves. That results in a series of abnormalities stemming from a decreased production of cortisol. So when cortisol drops, we also see a drop in aldosterone. This causes hypotension, hyperkalemia, and metabolic acidosis. We also see a characteristic hyperpigmentation, and this is due to increases in MSH that stimulates melanin production. Now, don't forget about the highly tested waterhouse Friderichsen syndrome, which is a primary adrenal insufficiency that occurs when septicemia causes adrenal hemorrhage. This can be due to DIC, um, endotoxic shock, but most often it's due to what organism? You should know this, Neisseria meningitidis. Okay, very important. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is the result of a decreased pituitary production of ACTH. And because there's no elevation in ACTH, we don't see the same hyperpigmentation that we'd see in primary adrenal insufficiency. Then we also see preservation of aldosterone synthesis and therefore potassium levels are normal here. So put those two side by side, primary versus secondary. In primary, we're gonna see what? We're going to see hyperkalemia, 
metabolic acidosis. We're going to see what? A drop in aldosterone. But in secondary, aldosterone is normal, potassium levels are normal. So they're very different with respect to their lab findings. Now tertiary adrenal insufficiency is going to be associated with an acute cessation of exogenous steroid use following a period of long chronic use. So let me say that again. You're going to see tertiary as a result of the cessation of exogenous steroid use following a long period of use. This, similarly to secondary, but unlike primary, doesn't affect aldosterone. Just keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to our next question. As always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then we'll see you here in a couple minutes to discuss the correct answer. Correct answer here is A. So next up, let's talk about hyperaldosteronism, which occurs when the adrenals secrete too much aldosterone. We have primary and secondary. Primary hyperaldosteronism is the result of either bilateral adrenal hyperplasia or an adrenal adenoma. Now, this will be characterized by increased aldosterone and decreased renin. And one of the keys to identifying this on exam day is by recognizing that despite treatment for hypertension, it doesn't get any better. Very easy to identify that. Secondary hyperaldosteronism can result from a few things, namely a renin-producing juxtaglomerular cell tumor, uh, renal vascular hypertension, or edema that results from certain conditions such as cirrhosis, um, nephrotic syndromes, or even heart failure. Now, it's important to note that while secondary hyperaldosteronism is associated with edema, the primary form is not. And that's because in primary hyperaldosteronism, the aldosterone escape mechanism, which make sure you understand that, doesn't directly cause edema, while in um, secondary, this effect is impaired. Now, the clinical features of hyperaldosteronism include hypertension, you can see normal or a decreased levels of potassium, as well as metabolic alkalosis. All right, let's move on from aldosteronism to our next question. Go ahead and pause, try and figure this one out, and then we'll see you back here in a couple minutes. The correct answer here is B, endemic amplification. So let's go over the most common tumor found in the adrenal medulla in children, which is what? The neuroblastoma. And the same in adults, which is what? The pheochromocytoma. I can almost guarantee you, you're gonna see a question on both of these. They're just everywhere, super high yield stuff. So first let's talk about the neuroblastoma, which as I mentioned, is the most common tumor of the adrenal medulla in children. And it's usually seen before four years of age. Now, this originates from the neurocrest cells, and one of its characteristics is that it can occur anywhere along the sympathetic chain. Now remember that it is easy to confuse this with the Wilms tumor. Very, very uh, similar findings, but this one presents with abdominal distension and a firm irregular mass that can cross the midline, while the Wilms tumor is going to be unilateral. Very important dif uh, distinction to make there, so you do not screw this up. Now, one of the other findings, aside from the abdominal mass here, is the presence of something known as Opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. And this is characterized by rapid multidirectional eye movement and involuntary muscle spasms. Now, in the urine, we will see an elevation in catecholamine, the catecholamine metabolites HVA and VMA. And histology will demonstrate the presence of homorite rosettes. It will show us that it is bombesin and NSE positive, and that it is associated with an amplification of what? The NMIC oncogene just like the question asked you. Now let's look at pheochromocytoma, which of course is the most common adrenal medulla, medulla tumor that you'll see in adults. This, unlike the neurocrest cell origin of the neuroblastoma, is derived from chromaffin cells. Now germline mutations can be associated with pheochromocytomas. So make sure you know that these can include germline mutations of NF1, of RET, and VHL. Now the symptoms of the pheochromocytoma are often caused by the secretion of catecholamines and can include things like episodic hypertension, and you can also see the secretion of erythropoietin that can cause polycythemia. Now don't forget the rule of tens, which says 10% are bilateral, 10% are malignant, 10% are outside of the adrenals, 10% are seen in children, and 10% can calcify. I always tell students so. The 10% rule also tells us that the overwhelming amount don't meet those criteria. So 90% won't be bilateral. 90% won't be malignant, okay? So keep that in mind. The majority is what you really wanna know. So, you know, I don't know why they tell you 10% uh, when, you know, the majority kind of goes the opposite way. But anyway, just something to keep in mind. Don't get hung up on the 10% rule. Remember that that means that the minority of, of, of cases present with these things. Lab findings will show us increased levels of homovanillic and vanilla mandelic acid in the urine and the plasma. 
and additional lab findings will demonstrate positive NSE, synaptophysin, and chromogranin. Now, we manage this with tumor resection, but there's something very important to remember that prior to surgery, we give a certain type of medication. What class of medication do we give first, and then what class do we give second? This is almost always a, a test question in some capacity. We're going to first give an irreversible alpha blocker, such as phenoxybenzamine, followed then by a beta blocker prior to the removal of the tumor. All right, don't forget that stuff, super high yield stuff. All right, let's move on to our next question. As always, go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is D, and that's a result of knowing that the patient in question has an insulinoma based on his symptoms and knowing that insulinomas are part of the MEN1 group that can also be linked to angiofibromas. So let's talk about the MEN syndromes and what you need to look for. First, these are super high yield, and even if they don't ask you directly one of these in a question, um, they're going to ask, give you the symptoms of one, and then you're gonna have to know what's associated with either that or one of the other MEN syndromes, so you need to know this stuff. MEN1 is associated with tumors of the pituitary, the pancreas, and the parathyroid, and it's also associated with mutations of the MEN1 gene that's found on chromosome 11. Not sure if that's super high yield, but it's genetics and genetics is, is growing on this exam. Now, additional associations that you wanna keep in mind when it comes to MEN1 are the presence of meningiomas, angiofibromas, and collagenomas. So how this would look in a vignette is a patient would have one of these lesions and they might ask you what else you might expect, which would be one of the main MEN1, MEN1 findings like the tumor of the pancreas, the parathyroid, or the pituitary. They might not exactly say that, but you'll need to look out for symptoms associated with one of these tumors as well as any of the other associated findings, like I mentioned, angiofibromas, meningiomas, collagenomas. Now, MEN2A is associated with parathyroid gland hyperplasia, pheochromocytoma, which we talked about a couple minutes ago, and medullary thyroid carcinoma, which means it affects the parafollicular C cells. Now, do you know off the top of your head which oncogene mutation this is associated with? If you said the RET oncogene, good job, you are correct. And don't forget which type of receptor this codes for. Do you know? This codes for the receptor tyrosine kinase. And the last of the MEN syndromes is, of course, MEN2B. This is associated with pheochromocytoma, medullary thyroid carcinoma, mucosal neuromas, and marfanoid habitus. Just as in MEN2A, this too is associated with the RET oncogene. All right, let's end this lecture right there. We'll see you back for the next lecture in a few minutes. <laughs>